All right, so we're looking at torque and moment of inertia and your lab, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. But the point of that lab was to show you that we have Newton's second law, which says net force equals mass times acceleration. That's for translational or linear motion, okay? And so that's that applies if something is moving along an incline or down a path or whatever, okay? We also now have this equation, net torque equals I times alpha, where I is called the moment of inertia. Okay, I is the moment of inertia, and it's related to mass, but it is not mass. Okay, and if you think about it, if you guys ever um, spun on a swing when you were little, you know, you twisted up the chains and then you spun. If you wanted to spin faster, you would pull your legs in, and if you wanted to spin slower, you would pull your legs out or push your legs out or whatever. And so you go in a circle and you can speed that up and slow it down. Well, if you think about it, if you're spinning something in a circle and all the mass is out here, you have to have a bigger force because it's got to accelerate faster to go in this curve. It's got a bigger distance to go through. Where if you put it all in the middle, its acceleration is smaller because if everything is concentrated right there in that point, its radius is zero, and so there's not much lever arm there with it. Okay, so I is moment of inertia, and it does depend on the shape and the mass. And on page 206, I think, in your book, there is a list of these. But for the most part, we usually use two. If you have a solid disk, and you spin it right through the middle, then I equals one-half mR squared. And so, like, the lab that you guys did where you measured the, the angular acceleration of those two disks, you should be able to calculate their, their moment of inertia using this equation, and it should compare pretty closely to the slopes you got on your lines. Okay? If you have a hollow disk, like a wheel, where all the mass is concentrated around the outside, then I equals mR squared, and you'll notice this is going to be a little bit bigger, and that's because the mass is further away from the axis of rotation. Okay? Um, and then you can check the book for um, several more of those. Okay, the important thing is that you understand that you now have two equations for torque. You have um, net force, or n net force. Uh, you have two equations for torque. I'm not worried about net force. I'm worried about torque. Okay, your two equations for torque are net torque equals net force times lever arm, or I times alpha angular acceleration. Okay, and so we're going to use these two together. Okay, so let's say for instance we have a big heavy pulley, and it's not necessarily a uniform disc, so I'm not sure what its moment of inertia is. Okay, and there's a big rope wrapped around it, and you pull down over here with a force of say 10 newtons. Okay, if that's the case, and this pulley has a mass of one kilogram. Um, and a radius of 0.1 meters, r equals 0.1. Okay, I want to know the moment of inertia of that pulley. Okay, and so what we do is we say, well, um, let's see. I guess you're you're going to need one more piece of information. Okay, so the radius is 0.1. You pull 10 newtons of force. This thing has a mass of one kilogram, and let's say um, the angular acceleration is. Actually, instead of giving you angular acceleration, let's make this a problem where you have to figure it out. Okay, and so let's say it goes from rest. This pulley goes from an initial velocity um, of zero radians per second, so it's not moving, and then you pull it, and its final velocity is uh, 30 radians per second, and this takes a time of 10 seconds. Okay, so I want to know the moment of inertia of this pulley. Okay, so the way you're going to start that is you're going to say, well, let's see how much force is applied, okay, uh, or torque. So the torque is equal to force times lever arm, and so you've got one force, 10 newtons. The lever arm is the radius, which is 0.1 meters, and so this equals one newton meter, okay. So the torque causing this thing to accelerate is one newton meter. Now that torque um, is also proportional to the moment of inertia and the angular acceleration, but be careful. Angular acceleration is just like linear acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Okay, so if this thing has a change in velocity, it went from uh, zero to thirty, so thirty minus zero divided by ten, because it took ten seconds, so over time equals alpha, and so this equals three 
uh, radians per second per second, radians per second squared. Okay, and so now I have one newton meter. That's my torque is equal to I times alpha, which is three, and I get um, I equals 0.33 meters squared or kilograms. Okay, now that's a weird unit. Okay, um, and if you think about it, why is it that the moment of inertia has units of kilogram meter squared, mass times distance squared. The reason for that is because it is related to mass, right? The heavier something is, the more mass it has, the harder it is to accelerate, but it's also related to the distribution of that mass. The further that mass is from the axis of rotation, the harder it is to get it to turn, okay? And so the more mass you have further from the axis, the greater the moment of inertia. Now, um, this has units kilogram meter squared, and so every formula is basically going to be mass times radius squared for moment of inertia, but then there's going to be a constant in front of it depending on the shape. Okay, So there's a worksheet today that you guys have to find a whole bunch of stuff out, um, and I want to go through one more problem. Okay, Let's say that uh, the wheels on a uh, whatever, a wheel has a moment of inertia um, it's a moment of inertia equal to um, 0.68 and it's got a radius of 0.42 um, meters. Okay, and that's actually a fairly big wheel. It would probably have a bigger moment of inertia than that, but that's okay. Okay. So a wheel has a moment of inertia 0.68, and this is, of course, kilogram meters squared, okay. and radius of 0.42 meters. I want this wheel to accelerate okay, from rest, initial velocity 0, to, um, let's say, 25 meters per second in 5 seconds. Okay. Now you have to stop and think about this for a minute because I'm giving you a whole bunch of information, but this is an angular velocity. This is a linear velocity. Okay, so you can't mix the two. You have to be able to convert back and forth. Okay, um, so a wheel has this moment of inertia, 0.68 kilogram meters squared, radius of 0.42 meters. It starts at rest. It ends up carrying whatever vehicle at 25 meters per second in five seconds, and I want to know how much torque. How much torque? must be applied. Okay, so how much torque is required? And so all you have to do on this one is figure out um, I alpha, right? And so um, I want the moment of inertia. Cool, I have it. Okay, there's I. Now I want the angular acceleration. Okay, well I know it's initial velocity. Angular velocity is zero. What do I do with this 25 meters per second? Okay. Well, 25 meters per second is a velocity, a linear velocity. Okay. And we remember we have three relationships. Theta times r equals x. Okay. So I guess this is really delta theta times r equals delta x. Okay. So as long as your velocities or positions or accelerations are measured in radians, all you have to do is multiply by the radius to get to the linear version of it. So um, omega equals times r equals v, that tells me omega equals v over r. So if I take my 25 meters per second and divide it by my 0.42, I get um, the the linear velocity, and or I, I start with linear velocity and I end with my angular velocity. Okay? So if we just take 25 divided by 0.42, we, we get 59.2 um, radians per second. 59.52, not 92, um, 52 radians per second. So that's actually my final velocity. And since I know it took five seconds, then I can say, all right, my angular acceleration, alpha, equals omega m minus omega naught, final minus initial, divided by time. So I'm just going to have 59.5 divided by 5, and that's 
almost 12, 11.9, right, um, radians per second per second. Okay, so now I know the final, I know the angular acceleration of that thing, and so if I want torque, all I have to do is multiply that, T equals I alpha, just multiply that by the moment of inertia. So I'm going to take my 11.9 times 0.68, and I'll have my final answer, okay? I'm going to be right around 12 times 7, about 80, okay, so about 8.4-ish um, is, is the torque, so that's newton meters. Okay, uh, that's one way when you have linear and angular velocities mixed. You got to make sure you remember your relationship between them. One more example: say something goes from uh, zero RPM revolutions per minute to 50 RPM in eight seconds. Okay, when a torque equal to two newton meters is applied. Okay? And wow, I spelled applied wrong. Is applied. I want to know the moment of inertia. I equals what? Okay? Well, RPMs, okay? You got to be careful with that. 0 to 50 RPM, 0 RPM is 0 radians per second, right? That's my initial velocity, omega naught. However, it is not my final velocity. My final velocity was given as 50 RPM. Okay, revolutions, revolutions per minute. How do I convert that to radians? Well, remember a radian, there's 2 pi radians per revolution. So I'm going to multiply by 2 pi radians, divide by revolutions, right? That's 1, 2 pi radians per revolution. That cancels that. But then I also have to deal with the minutes. And so um, we have times 1 minute over 60 seconds. Okay, so you have 50 times 2 pi divided by 60, which is 100 pi divided by 60, okay, and that gives you your final velocity. Okay, in 8 seconds, so you're going to take 100 pi divided by 60 minus 0, right, that's your change in velocity, all that divided by 8 to get your angular acceleration, and then since you know the torque was applied, you're going to say 2 newton meters, the torque equals, whoops, torque equals I times alpha. So you have 2 equals I times whatever this number works out to be, and you can solve for I. Okay. Um, so don't let unit conversions mess with you. Uh, the worksheet is kind of long, but um, just several of these problems over and over and over again. And remember, the kinematic equations you had before, Okay, you had three kinematic equations. You had Y equals 1 half AT squared plus V naught T plus Y naught. That's the second equation. The first equation, V equals V naught plus AT. And then the last equation, V squared equals V naught squared plus 2A delta X. Okay, whatever. These three equations, they work exactly the same way in angular, but you just got to make sure everything's measured in radians per second. So you can say the final position, theta, is equal to 1 half alpha, the angular, or angular acceleration, T squared plus omega naught plus um, theta naught, right, initial position. You can say that the final angular velocity is equal to the initial angular velocity plus angular acceleration times time, and you can say omega squared equals omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta, right? And so remember, a change in x is a change in linear position. Okay, its angular equivalent is delta theta change in angular position. What angle did it move through? V is linear velocity. Its angular equivalent is omega, okay? Um, rate of change of angular position. And then A is linear acceleration. Its angular equivalent is alpha. Its angular acceleration, okay? And as long as this is measured in radians per second, then all you have to do is multiply this by R, and this becomes an equality. Multiply this by R, and this becomes an equality. Multiply this by R, and this becomes an equality. That's only true if that's measured in radians per second, not in revolutions per minute or degrees or whatever. It has to be in radians per second.